If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, who brought a Bible? Who brought it? Let's see it. Hold it up. Make the devil mad. Hallelujah. Whether it's pages or glowing, we respect pages. Glows are second class, but they're good. 
Always, always, always bring your Bibles. Amen? Uh, always. It's, uh, uh, Paul never got upset when the people at Berea checked out what he was saying with the scriptures, with the scrolls they had. No preacher should ever get upset by you checking out if what they're saying is according to God's word. And if they do, you better run from that preacher. Amen. The second announcement is uh, if you're not getting our e-letter, please uh, send us an email to elevatelincoln.com. We put out maybe four a month so we don't flood your uh, email. We don't sell it uh, or give it our list to anybody else. So uh, now some of you, you put in your email and for some reason uh, our place where we go to put out our letters didn't receive it. Don't worry, you don't have to do it again. I've already contacted John Wooten, who does our website. He's on it. He's going to correct the problem, and then I will go back and add you in one at a time just by hand. Amen. So you don't have to worry about it. All right. Uh, If you would please open your Bibles up first to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I've got to... uh, I've got to say this before I bring my next slide up because I, had a, I have a series that has been in my spirit, been in my mind, I've been working on, uh, Kirby can tell you, for months, and even Michael can attest to it, called uh, Life Lessons from David, from when David in the Old Testament was a shepherd boy to the day of his death. That covers so much, so much in there. Life Lessons from David. But... As I was in here praying this morning, and we have prayer here at the church Sunday morning, 7 to 8 o'clock, and it's open to anybody. But it's not for the faint of heart. I'll just tell you, because we get a little loud sometimes. So uh, if you feel like you want to come and join us between 7 and 8 Sunday mornings right here in the sanctuary, please make your way here. Come through the side door, front door. It's usually locked. Park in the back. Come inside. And then at 8 o'clock, go get you a little breakfast or something. Come back for the 9.30 service. And then you love it so much, you stick around for the 11 o'clock service. I got no amens there. (laughs) Revelation, are you there? So while I was here praying, about 20 till 8, God dropped a word in my spirit. And so I changed the message for today, and I want to talk about the two great judgments. The two great judgments. Actually, there's going to be three judgments. Because in the book of Peter, it talks about there's a day coming when God is going to judge the angels that fell. But we don't have anything to do with that right then at that time. So that's not what I want to talk about. But I do want to talk about the two great judgments. And the first one is the, called the great white throne judgment. And the second one is called the, the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, are you with me? Somebody's already shocked. Uh, So I'm going to talk about both of those. Let me go to Ecclesiastes 3.17. He said, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Make no mistake about it. Everybody here, under the sound of my voice, watch it on television, watch it on Facebook, YouTube, whatever, every one of you will be at one of these two judgments. You will either be at the great white throne judgment which is where all the unrighteous dead will be. All those people who said no to Christ, all those people who said, I don't need that, I don't want him, I don't believe in him, bunk on him, all those people will be there. Not one Christian will be at the great white throne judgment. The second judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, not one unrighteous person will be there, not one, not one sinner. The judgment seat of Christ is for Christians. It's for the righteous, those who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus, not those that are just using him as a commodity. See, some people even in here, all Jesus is to you is a commodity. You don't want to go to hell, so you want to accept Jesus. Or you got into trouble, and so you need Jesus. He's not here to be a commodity. He's not some cosmic bellhop here to cater to all your hurts, wants, and needs. No, he's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And when you bow your knee to him, you are surrendering the whole of your life. He becomes the hub and not a spoke. For some of you right now, he's a spoke, you're the hub. 
You've just added him to your life because you needed him or you need him for something or you like the idea of being religious or spiritual. You will be at the great white throne judgment. When Jesus becomes the hub and he's the center and he sits on the throne of your life, and everything else in your life, your family, your job, all of that becomes spokes, then you will be at the believer's judgment seat of Christ. Captain, since last Easter, when I started examining how Jesus put forth what it means to follow him, it has shaken me to my core not just for myself, but for the many people I know who are just playing church, just playing games. This message is not a popular message. People may never come back to this church because of this message today. They will go to another church where they will find, and the Bible says there are many, somebody to tickle your ear, tell you what you want to hear, tell you how nice you are, and all of this. I'm a watchman. I'm a pastor. I'm going to be held accountable for what I preach to you. I'm going to be held in double judgment. I take that very serious. My wife and I, we love you. We pray over you. We cry over you. And that's how serious I take it because it is that serious. He said, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Oh, yeah, he will. That day's coming. For there is a time for every purpose and every work. And then again in Ecclesiastes, God will bring every work into judgment. Everything we've ever said, everything we've ever done, every action, every good action, every wicked action, God will bring every secret thing, even thing no one knows about but you. God will bring it, whether it be good or whether it be evil, he will bring it into judgment. Now, for a believer, if you're a believer in Christ, a follower of Christ, this message will be encouraging to you. If you're professing belief in Christ and yet you're kind of slipshoddy in your walk, this message will bring, hopefully, conviction to you. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, hopefully this message will draw you to him. Hopefully it will. And that's our desire. I was going to ask people, why are you following Jesus? Why? And then the question came, why aren't you following Jesus? God's going to bring every work in the judgment. There are two judgments, amen, for human people. Now, the righteous and the unrighteous. Go to... We're going to talk about the great white throne judgment. Would you please go to Revelation chapter 20? And we're going to start with verse 11, and I'm going to bring verse 12 up on the screen. Verse 11. This is John, the beloved apostle, on the Isle of Patmos. And you know, this is where he got the book of Revelation. It was given to him by Jesus Christ. He was given visions. He was given words. He was given prophetic events that were shortly to come and that were going to come. Can you say amen? And he said, he's standing there and he says, I saw a great white throne. Verse 11, are you with me? I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place for them. And I gotta stop right there and tell you, this is the only time in human history where the unrighteous dead, those who have died and gone to hell, and yes, they're there now. Those who died in their sins, those who did not put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and that are in hell right now. This is the only time in human history that they are released from hell and it's to stand before Jesus, the holy and righteous king of the universe upon, in front of his great white throne in heaven. This judgment takes place in heaven. If you're there, and hopefully you will not be, if you're one of the unrighteous dead and you're standing there, you'll see the great white throne and you'll see the city, the new Jerusalem behind it. And you will know intuitively that you will never enter that place. 
In fact, if you're there and this is the only time that you are let out of hell, and listen, hell was designed for your unrighteous nature. For an unrighteous person, to stand before perfection and to stand before complete holiness is worse than being in hell. You think you would get a reprieve by standing before the righteous judge of the universe, but no, no, it's worse. You'll be cowering. You won't be able to look upon him. I love it when people, people, sinners will tell me, yeah, well, when I get to God's judgment, I'm gonna tell him a thing or two. And then when they get a traffic ticket and they're in court, it's yes, judge, no judge, yes, sir, no, sir. It's the only time. After the judgment, the Bible says they are cast into a lake of fire which was made for the devil and his fallen angels. Wasn't made for you. But that's where you're going when you reject Jesus and you say, I don't want him, I don't need him. He can take a hike out of my life and you die in your sins. People say, well, oh, never mind, I won't go there. It's a whole nother deal. So this is the only time in human history they're let out of hell, and it's to stand before this judgment. And he said, I saw the dead. That's the spiritually dead. I saw the dead. That's those who've never received Christ. That's those who turn their back on Christ. Pastor, once saved, always saved. It's not in the Bible. The book of Jude talks about those who are twice dead. They were dead, they became alive, received the life of Christ, and then died again. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, he that overcomes, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Now, either that's an idle threat, and we would say, ha, nice try, Jesus, you can't blot my name out because once saved, always saved. Or, that's a true warning. He that overcometh, I will not blot his name out of the book. I saw the dead, small and great. Didn't matter if you were poverty stricken, if you were a billionaire. Didn't matter if you were male or female. Didn't matter if you had a reputation and everybody knew you didn't have a reputation and you were nobody nobody knew you doesn't matter small and dead didn't matter how much money you had how much influence you had how many good things you'd done for the human race if mother Teresa if she died in her sins hear this if she died in her sins without putting her faith and her trust in the completed work of Christ she will be there even though she did so many great works because your works do not save you. It's putting your faith, your trust in what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Putting it all, saying, Jesus, you're my all in all. When he said it is finished, it's finished. Jesus, you're my everything. You're it. I put everything in you. I do good works, Lord, but not to get me saved. I do them because I am saved. I know it's going to be hard for some to hear. He said, I saw him stand before God. Who's sitting on the throne? Jesus. Is he not God? Remember when Jesus said, the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Why? Because he became a man. Not the Father. The Son did. He said, stand before God, and the books were open. What books are those, Pastor Mike? Every deed, every deed they'd ever done, every word they'd ever spoken. God keeps books, people. Every curse word, every hateful word, every evil thing, every wicked thing, every racial thing, God keeps books. Why do he keep those books? Because God is so just. He's not gonna, 
He's not going to, the, the neighbor, the American Joe neighbor who pays his taxes and never beat his wife, uh, was nice to his kids, helped people, yet never received Christ and died in his sins and in hell. He's not going to suffer the same punishment as a Saddam Hussein or an Adolf Hitler. Oh no, they're both going. They're going to the lake of fire, but the severity of their punishment. God keeps books. And he does that on the Christian side too, and we'll get over into it. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. Now, what are they being judged for? Not to see if they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. If you're at that judgment, that's your eternal home. You're not there to be determined whether or not you're saved or lost. No, you're lost. And you're there because you died in your sins. Sin separates you from God. They were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So they will suffer the severity of their works. But they're there. Not one Christian will be there. Let's keep reading. And the sea, verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, here it is again in case we missed it, every man according to to their works to determine the severity of the punishment and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Who's going and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Pastor, how do I get my name in the book of life? You humble yourself before Jesus and you tell Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can do nothing to save myself. I believe in you, Jesus. I thank you that you went to the cross in my place for my sins and I repent of my sins. I turn from them and I turn to you and I put all my trust in you for my salvation and he saves you and you're excited because you can't believe, I can't believe the day I got saved. And listen, there are people here a lot worse than I was, but I knew the day I got saved, it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he would save me. I couldn't believe that he would forgive me of all of my sins. It was incredible. And there was a peace there, and there was a joy there. And I want to live for Jesus. Pastor Mike, have you ever struggled? Have you? Anybody in here never sinned after you gave your life to Christ? Let me see your hand. You've never committed a sin after you got saved. Not a one of you. If you do, spread your wings, fly around. We want to put it on Instagram. But here's the difference. As a Christian... Yeah, I may stumble. I may even deliberately go into sin. But because I'm a Christian, I get the conviction of the Holy Ghost because my nature is not to do that. But sometimes I yield to my flesh. Anybody else say amen. And then what happens, Pastor? You know what happens. You feel like crap. Yes, I said it. C-R-A-P. You feel like it. And what do you do if you're a Christian? You go to Jesus right away. And you say, you go to the lover of your soul. You go to your high priest. You go to there's only one mediator between God and man. It ain't Mary. It's Jesus Christ the righteous. And you go to him and you say, Jesus, I have sinned and I repent and I ask you to forgive me. And because of who he is and what he's done, he washes you with his precious blood from that sin. And you arise righteous and holy and justified in his sight because of his blood, not because of your works. If you call yourself a Christian and you hate living for Jesus, you are not saved. If you call yourself a Christian and it's a constant struggle for you to serve Jesus, for you to praise him, for you to read your word, you're not saved. Now I didn't say, listen, I'm a pastor. I don't wake up every morning, whoo, I get to read the word today. 
There's some day I'd rather watch Longmire. <laughs> there are some days I gotta make myself read the word because I know it's the right thing to do. There are days I gotta make myself begin praying because I know it's the right thing to do. But after I get started, whoo, I love it. Tell the truth and shame the devil. No one knows what that means, but it sounds good. <laughs> Hebrews, let me just turn there. You're, you're at 1 Corinthians 5, right? Or 3. 1 Corinthians 3, please. You go to 1 Corinthians 3. Let me bring up Hebrews 11. It says this. Without faith, we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ now, where hopefully everybody in this room will be. Because you're going to be a one of two judgments. You decide which one. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Do you believe that? Yes. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That makes perfect sense to me. And also, now watch this, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. A diligently seek him doesn't just mean I'm trying to find, it means I'm seeking his will for my life, I'm seeking his plan for my life, I'm seeking his purpose for my life, I'm seeking him and I'm putting into action that which I find. Hello, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I don't know about you, I like rewards, I like gifts, you saw that. Got a couple of uh, coffee cup, I love gifts, I love rewards. Hopefully you do too. Now, I'm not in this thing to get rewards, but also I don't want to fall under this false humiliation. Well, you know, I ain't doing it for reward. I'm not either, but we're going to get rewards. Because God loves to reward his children. I love to reward my children. There's Wesley sitting over there, you know, when he's pleasing to me. I love to reward him. I love to reward John. I love to reward my children. You do too. Why? It's just in you. God's so much greater than you and I are. He loves to reward his children and he will reward us on that day. But I'm not in it for the rewards. I'm not working. I'm not consciously going, yeah, I'm gonna give this money for the reward. But I know this is gonna be there. Yeah, I'm gonna pray for this person for the reward. No, no, that's, that's ill, that's wrong. I just know it's gonna be there. Why? Because of that verse right there. Are you with me? Are you listening to me? Okay. So, we, so don't, just know God rewards the faithful. God rewards those who diligently seek him. Just know it's coming. And I thank him for it. I can't wait. And I know some of y'all in here, you're gonna get greater rewards than I do. That's okay. Hallelujah for you. Paul writing to the Christian church, and we know this by the way he's writing. He says, we, we, we the church, we believers, we. Followers of Christ, we're confident, yes, and well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We know if we were to die as Christians right now, it's goodbye world and hello Jesus. That's right. Ain't no soul sleep, ain't no purgatory. Someone said, well, pastor, I, I think there's soul sleep. I mean, you know, because Jesus refers sleep as dying. I said, look, then how about Revelation 5 when John is, is in heaven and he says, I see a great multitude of people and I see all these angels and the 24 elders and I see uh, someone on the throne. They have a book in their right hand and the question was given by the angel who is worthy to come and take the book out of the right hand of him that sits on the throne. And John said, there was no man in heaven or earth or under the earth that was able, but then the Lamb of God came. Jesus came and took it, right? We're confident to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Stop right there. What you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. Did you hear me? What you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. How can I put this without messing it up? How you live for him determines how you'll spend eternity. You receive him as your Lord and Savior? Whew. 
and you mean it, you spend an eternity with him, how you spend an eternity with him, that's up to you. I think it was, it was uh, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army back in the day when it was a lot better than it is today. Still good, but it was a lot better back then. The reason he found it is because I can't remember if he had a dream or if he died and had this dream, but he dreamt he was in heaven because he was a Christian. And he was there and he said, man, it was just beautiful, the colors and the every, it was just amazing. And he said, and all of a sudden here came like this, this, this chorus of, of people. He said, and they circled all around me and they're just so joyful, he said, and they're singing. And now all of a sudden Christ comes and appears in the midst of them. And he said, it was such a beautiful sight to behold. And he said, but then I got to thinking, he says, why am I not, they seem to be more joyful than I am. They seem to be more grateful than I am, more thankful than I am. And the Lord showed him his life and said, these are they who love not their lives to the death. And that didn't mean they were martyred. Some of them were, but some of them weren't. He said, these are they who love not their lives to the death. These are they who gave up everything for me. In the, in the book of Acts, when it says, you shall receive power, Acts 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. A lot of people read that, especially they that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they go, Jesus gives you the power to witness. Anybody can witness. An atheist can witness. Jehovah's Witness witness. Mormon's witness. It's not saying, oh, now you got the power to witness. That word witness is the same word as the word martyr. Someone who died for Christ. And so that word is saying, he's saying, you will, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, he will empower you in such a way, he will drastically change you in such a way, you will be a living martyr to me. You will have died to yourself and everything that's of this world, that fights for your attention, fights for your loyalty, fights for your devotion, and you'll be a living witness unto me. That's only accomplished through us yielding to the Holy Spirit. So William Booth said that he got that vision and he saw his life. The Lord showed him his life. Uh, he was just kind of one of these mediocre type Christians, pretty much thought for himself, read his Bible, you know, went to church, prayed every now and then, but really, really didn't pour himself out for Christ. We're going to get to that because some of you are like, no, that ain't in the Bible. I'll show it to you. To be well-pleasing to him. You can't do anything. You, there's nothing you can do to get God to love you any more than he does right now. You can't give enough money. There's not enough people you can witness to. There's not enough people you can pray for. There's not enough fasting you can do. There's not enough Bible reading. You, you cannot do anything to get God to love you any more than he loves you right now. But how pleased he is with your walk with him is totally 100% up to you. My son Wesley and my other sons, I love them. I will never love them any less. I will never love them any more than I do right now. There's no way they can hurt me enough to get me to love them any less or, or do something to get me to love them any more. But how well pleased I am with them is totally up to them. And it's the same way with us and Jesus. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body while we're here on earth according to what he has done, whether good or, or bad. Now, that's the Bible. That's written to Christians. Go with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 3. And while we're turning there, when I say the word judgment, a lot of us, we think of the negative. We think of punishment, don't we? Yeah. We think of, oh boy, you know, you're going to get it. Here's, what the, here's the definition of the word judgment, especially in these verses in the Greek. Judgment is a decision resulting from an investigation. So here we are at the judgment seat of Christ. 
1 Corinthians 3, everything we've done, said, is judged. It's all reviewed, and a decision is made from that investigation. So let's pick it up, 1 Corinthians 3, and then we're going to close verse 11. Paul saying, there's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's it. He's the foundation, man. Not your good works, not how much money you gave, not how much Bible you read, not how many hours you've prayed. That's not the foundation of your salvation. We all know it's Jesus Christ, don't we? Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's what we stand upon. He's what we build upon. Right? Hello? So, I am saved by grace. What is grace? Unmerited love, unmerited favor. I stand on the rock, on the foundation of Jesus. Everything he did in his death, burial, and resurrection, that's what I'm standing on for my salvation, and hopefully you are too. That's it. So let's go, let's go on. No other foundation can be laid. Now, if a man build upon this foundation, and we do, and when I say man, I mean men and women. How many know it's inclusive? If any man, any person build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Pastor, what is the wood, hay, stubble? That's everything we've ever said or ever done that's out of our own self-righteousness. I served over here in church so people will recognize and appreciate me. I gave this amount of money so people will know and appreciate me. I, I, I prayed this, 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 this lousy prayer because I said I'd pray for this person and so I don't want to be a liar so I just shot up some unheartfelt prayer. That's wood, hay, and stubble. Anything I've said or done that isn't on the foundation of glorifying Jesus simply for who he is and what he's done, that's wood, hay, and stubble. Are you listening to me? What's the gold? What's the precious stones? What's the silver? Everything I did, especially in secret that nobody else knew about, all because of the love of Jesus that he gave me. See, everything you have as a Christian or even as a non-Christian, well, let me talk to Christians. Everything you have, every talent, every ability that you have, every bit of love and, and forgiveness and mercy, and that all came from the hand of God, all of it. It's not even yours. You didn't originate it. He did. You are a steward of it. And he will call you into stewardship accountability on that day. What did you do with the finances I gave you? What did you do with the love I gave you? What did you do with the talent I gave you? What did you do with the ability I gave you? What, what did you do with it? Let's keep reading. Now see, for me, this is encouraging to me. Oh yeah, it's somewhat convicting. Because I know there are times in my past, woo. I threw the $100 on top of the offering so the guy next to me saw it. Come on. I prayed that little weak, wimpy prayer just because I didn't want to. So I, next time I see the brother, I can say, yeah, I prayed for you. Anybody else? We're going to have an altar call for liars at the end. <laughs> I served and I did that thing just so people would say, look at that, that's the pastor serving. It's going to be burned up. But everything you and I have done that's out of a pure heart based on the love of God to honor Jesus, you're getting a reward. I don't care if it's leaving a track at your restaurant table with the tip. And you didn't tell everybody, hey, I'm going to leave a track. You know, a gospel pamphlet. You just did it. Because you appreciate, like those songs said, oh, how he loves us. I can't believe he loves me that much. I, I, I can't wait to live for him again. Come on. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest the day, what day? Day of judgment shall declare it. It shall be revealed by fire. That's God's fire. God's fire will do one of two things. It'll purify or it'll cleanse. 
or it'll, excuse me, three things, it'll consume. Anybody heard of John Bevere? Okay. No, I haven't read his book, but I know he's got a book out called Driven by Eternity. Anybody read that book? Okay, it's a great book from what I hear. He talks about this very thing. He said that, I don't know, uh, years ago, a few years ago, he went to some, I can't even remember the country, in South, uh, South America. It might have been uh, Brazil. It might have been Brazil or somewhere like that. He, went to, he was invited to a conference where he spoke to, I think he said, 30,000 30, pastors. Let's say 15,000. 15,000 pastors, just to be sure, just to be on the safe side. And so he's like just amazed that that was the, just the pastors and leaders. And so he's asking the, the head guy, he goes, man, how many, how many you have in your, in your organization, in your churches? Because they had tons of churches all over. He said about 300,000. He said, well, how long y'all been in existence? Because he figured they were going to say, you know, 1950 or something like that. He said 16 years. He said, how is it? He goes, that's unheard of. He said, how is it that you have so many converts, so many people in 300,000, 16 years? He said, pastor, it's because we preach and we teach our people about judgment and eternal rewards. He said, in America, you don't. He said, I've been to America. You people preach a lot of fluff messages that make people feel good. He said, but we preach about judgment an eternal reward. And not judgment like this, but judgment like it's exciting to live for Jesus. It's exciting to want to do his will. It's exciting, amen, to me to pour out my life for Jesus because God is not unrighteous. He will reward the faithful. It's exciting. That's what keeps me going. I miss all the gut-wrenching, the backstabbing, the, the, the name-smearing, the people that hurt you, spit in your face after you did something good for them, and they leave, and, and they blogged about you and Facebooked about you and told people don't. You know what keeps me going? I know God's faithful. Come on, he's faithful. I hold no grudges. I let it go because he's faithful. I'm not going to stand before them. I'm going to stand before the king. The king is always right. Let's finish this up. Get ready for my video. I don't need a pianist. Thank you. In verse 13, the fire shall try every man's work. Now watch this. You're there. You're here at the judgment because you're saved. You're not there to determine if you're saved or not. No, thank God. If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you can do one of these. Whew. Take your little hanky and go, man, I made it one more ordeal to go through and that's where my works all get tried. But I'm saved. Thank then you look over and you see Eskenazi and you're like, can't believe he made it. Amen. <laughs> Love you, brother. Now watch this. Verse 14. If any man's work abide, the fire goes. <laughs> the fire dissipates. You look. Your work is still there. Why is it still there? Because you did it out of love for Jesus and for the people. First for him, second for the people. Love the Lord your God, your neighbor as yourself. It makes the cross. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Or you're there. You hear the fire, you turn around. Oh. There's a pile of ashes. That one didn't make it. You guys read the Bible like that? That's how I read it. Verse 15, if any man's works shall be burned, he will suffer loss. Watch this, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So that shows you, man, you're there uh, because your works are gonna be tried so that you may get the reward that God has for you. Now, I don't know about you, but that just puts a fire in me. That just makes me want to forgive everybody who wants to hurt me, say bad things about me. Dude, you don't even know what I got coming. I love Jesus. I'm doing this for him. Play the video, please. The Bible says, my Turn king, it up. Turn it up. king of the Jews, 
He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. That's my king. Yeah. Did it stop or is there more? There's more playing. Praise God. Woo! Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Do you know him? Do you know him or do you just know about him? There's a difference. Growing up, I knew about him. But at age 20, I got to know him. I got to know him when I was at a service. And they said, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come to this altar. We want to pray for you. And at the age of 20, my wife and I got up, walked down to that altar. We didn't look around to see if anybody else was. We could have cared less. We knew sitting there we were sinners doomed to a devil's hell. We knew there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. And we just heard this wonderful, glorious gospel that Jesus Christ, friend of sinners, went to the cross in our place for our sins and took the judgment of God upon himself so that we could escape it by putting the whole of our trust in Jesus. And he had his arms wide open and was calling us, even though we were dopers and drinkers and fornicators and filled with lust and lying and thievery. 
He called us. The Holy Spirit drew us. And we said yes. And we didn't harden our hearts. And if you're here today, you're not right with Jesus and you know it. Please get up out of your seat right now and come to this altar and say, Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus right now. Don't look around. If you mean business with Jesus, you know you're not right with him. Get up out of your seat right now and come to this altar so I can pray for you in the name of Jesus right now. Right now. Don't wait for someone else. You break the ice. Come down to this altar right now. There's one. Come down to this altar right now. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit away. Don't sin away the day of your salvation. No one right. There's another. No one writes. No one puts down in their, in their, in their phone or their computer, hey, next week I'm going to give my life to Christ. No, you got to strike while the iron's hot. You got to come to Christ when you know the Holy Spirit is drawing you, wooing you, and with the love of God, he's pulling you to your Savior. There's two. Anyone else? I need Jesus, Pastor. I'm not right with God. I knew him, Pastor, but I walked away from him. And pastor, today, I feel his love and I feel his conviction. Don't stay in your seat crying. Get up out of your seat and walk down to this altar and surrender. Every person Jesus called, he called publicly. Every one of them. If you can't stand for him here, you won't stand for him outside the walls of the church. I'm going to wait 30 more seconds. Anybody else? Some of your heart's about ready to beat out of your chest. Some of you are sweating under the Holy Ghost. You need to come. There's another. Some of you have been doing stuff ain't right. Some of you got dope in your pocket, possibly in your car. You got condoms and you're not married. And yet you're going to say you're living for Christ. Got people in the body of Christ living together, having sex outside of marriage, and yet call themselves Christians. You're deceived as much as Eve was. God knows every secret you you got right now. He knows it. You're not going to surprise him. He loves you. He's calling you, not me. Anyone else? Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus. I need to get right. I need to make my peace with my Savior. Anyone else? There's another. And you that are here, I want you to keep your eyes closed and you begin talking to Jesus right now. You tell him what you want. You tell him that you are a sinner. You tell him that you want him in your life. You want him to forgive you of your sins, that you're turning from selfishness and you are turning to him and that you want to live for him. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it does mean you're going to have power. You're going to have power to say no. You're going to have power to say yes. Anyone else? Sister Joanne, I'm going to need you today. If you would take these two girls back to the office. Kirby, if you'd take these two men. If you people, please, the two ladies, if you'd go with Joanne over here, she's going to take you to the uh, Sunday school room, going to pray with you, put a gift in your hand. Kirby will make sure you get what you need. Young men, if you'll go back with Kirby right now, he's going to take you and pray with you right now. Give him a hand. Come on. Come on. Give him a hand. Oh, Jesus, come on. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, stand to your feet, would you please? Stand to your feet. Oh, Jesus. 
Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Stand to your feet if you would, please. I want to pray for you. But before I pray, I want to admonish you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, man, that sermon's for me. I've been living selfishly. Pastor, I haven't been living with Jesus and eternity in mind. I've been living mostly for myself. I've been spending money mostly for myself. The talents and abilities God's given me, I've been keeping them mostly for myself. I want to challenge you when you get home at home today, please go in your, your prayer closet. Get alone. Get alone, with, whether it's your car, whether you have to go on a walk, whether you got to lock yourself in the bathroom, I don't care. Get alone with Jesus and say, Lord, search me and try me. And Jesus, I want to live for you. I want my Christian life to be a joy and not a drudgery. It's only a drudgery when I put myself ahead of you, Jesus. Help me to put you ahead of me. Lord, and you know he'll do it. He'll help you because he loves you. You hear me? He's not against you. He's for you. Lord Jesus, bless this people. Bless them spiritually, bless them physically, bless them financially, I pray. Help them to put their trust in you in every area of their life, in their relationships, in their family, in their jobs. Lord Jesus, in their finances, in their praying, all of it. In your name we pray. We love you. God bless you.